grief affects us as people in multiple ways. And they, grief, typically, um, mo many conversations about grief talk about the emotional impact, the sadness, yearning, anger, guilt. It, it, but there are also major physical implications, fatigue, changes in appetite, headaches, stomach issues, chest pain. These sometimes manifest together as cognitive and behavioral issues, social withdrawal, avoidance, restlessness, difficulty concentrating, and even more existential thoughts about searching for meaning, about questioning existence and life. Now, one of the misconceptions about grief academically is that it's this idea that it's linear and just goes from being hurt, go through a bit of a spiral and land up at adjustment, all good, right? Easy. But the reality is it will usually bounce around different areas. You might go from shock to hope, all the way to anger, to watching four years of Battlestar Galactica in two weeks, true story. And systemically, grief can be seen as a disturbance of the natural equilibrium of our societal, familial, and individual systems. Grief can, basic, grief can impact our communities, and we can notice second order impacts being felt across immediate and extended family, friends and broader social networks, professional environments, healthcare systems, and education systems. This is an example that came from a recent project we did with the city of Toronto and um, Dixon Hall in the neighborhood of Cabbage Town. And this was looking at the effects of the concentration of supportive housing services in Cabbage Town versus Rosedale, a higher income neighborhood. And you can see the stark difference in um, the number of services in these neighborhoods. And a, a lot of it, based on doing primary research in the neighborhoods, talking to people across different um, streets, zones, and types of housing, we were able to uncover a lot of misunderstanding about the causes of homelessness, what leads to it, and it was manifesting in a loss of dignity for people who, were, who needed supportive housing in the neighborhood, isolation and alien, alienation of those who lacked housing. And it cascaded out to creating lack of opportunities for supporting housing, supportive housing tenants to integrate in the community, to take part in art or be able to get involved in any kind of meaningful lifestyle change. And this winds up creating a feedback loop of exacerbating addiction and mental health issues. And we realized through this project too that many have been socialized to think that things like addiction, homelessness or aggression are choices as opposed to systemic implications or outcomes. Can be both but um, oftentimes inadequate ways of addressing grief reinforce and sometimes amplify its impacts. So we see generational differences, cultural taboos, and stigmatization of emotional expression across different identities, which prevent us from adequately talking about grief. We see healthcare implications, like the over-medicalization of grief, whether it's promoting a pint to calm your woes or prescription medication, um, the idea of education around grief being inaccessible. First of all, even that's when it is available. And sometimes, and then it can be very expensive. And then as we mentioned, the academic misinterpretation of stages of grief. But the one that strikes me the most and annoys me the most is our bereavement policies at works and workplaces and institutions. And I remember once having um, somebody work with come back and boast to their team that they came back to work the day after their mother had passed away and they expected everyone else to be able to come back soon as well. And that felt to me to be very disconnected from the reality of grief around human needs, around being able to create a team that can actually show up as opposed to just kind of being put in a meat grinder. So bereavement policies are something that we really hope to influence and address with Space for Grief. Um, so now coming back to systems from their individual, so basically through a series of interconnected variables and events, unresolved grief can wind up having a tremendous impact on our societies beyond the community impacts I mentioned. So we can see reduced civic participation, strains on our healthcare, legal education systems, um, declining economic health, mental health epidemic, and also um, reduced life expectancy actually. In the US alone, workplace grief costs are estimated to be at around $225.8 billion per year. And in terms of mental health, the WHO classifies disability as depression as the leading cause of disability with over 264 million impacted globally. And we can see as well that 
looking at root causes, a lot of societal value systems that prioritize profits over health wind up creating accidental adversaries about around productivity versus mental health and force them to compete against each other. Much of this could be avoided with a bit more empathy and understanding and also investment resources, the policy change and all, but you know, first it helps to address the fundamental mindsets and biases. Given the amount of grief that we were seeing across our research, we wanted to experiment a little bit. And we wanted to play with art because art felt like it provides a safer space, more nuanced discussion, and it's an abstract platform that allows us to confront, discuss, and understand taboo subjects, fostering dialogue and challenge societal norms. So we also noticed that art forms such as music, film, theater, and photography are able to both capture and convey dense information in, in accessible ways. This is much more convenient for the picture. This inspired us to explore an intervention rooted in the arts, and especially because arts are able to facilitate emotional expression better than a report or textbook. So this is where Space for Grief came about. Some of the guiding principles we have around Space for Grief, we're gonna pass over to Fran to walk us through and talk to, to us a little bit about how the exhibit manifested and some of its impact. So before we go into describing what Space for Grief was, because we know it's a grief kind of intervention, uh, we wanna talk a little bit about the guiding principles. And <clears throat> through my research I, that I carried out at OCAD, which was um, under, uh, with my advisor, Peter Jones, who's here, shout him out. Uh, <laughs> I was looking at how do we design more inclusive death and grief practices and rituals? And um, what came across out of all the research were these kind of guiding points. <clears throat> the presence of others helps to lighten the load. And so this is really about how uh, words can fall short. And we think if I say, the, I'm so focused on saying the right thing, but it's actually just being with the person, watching a movie with them, uh, showing up. Um, Grief literacy, so we don't learn about grief. We don't talk about it. We actually only talk about it in the most vulnerable moments. Um, so you can't really plan for anything around it. And there's no education, so we don't even know how to show up for people. Uh, common practices and beautiful welcoming spaces. So one thing that's common across religion is they have these beautiful, magnificent spaces um, that contrast some of the heavier times of our lives. And, and so that's something that really uh, came out again and again. Um, and you'll see with Space for Grief, that's a, a, one of our principles. Um, acknowledgement that grief is not linear or temporary, like grief is forever. My dad passed away in February, 2021. I'm always gonna miss my dad. I'm always gonna cry for him. So, and I think that's okay. And then the last thing is uh, accessible and inclusive. Um, thinking about Rory's presentation on Friday for those that were here. And just starting with um, accessibility, that was our, our, our priority, and, and making it welcoming for everyone, for all cultures, all backgrounds. How do we do that in a, in a city like Toronto? Oh, okay, so this is the Toronto Reference Library for those that are not from Toronto. It's magnificent, it's beautiful. Um, and uh, during, during, we started shopping this idea around pre-pandemic and people were like, oh, grief, it's so taboo. Then the pandemic happened uh, and we had people reaching back out to us. And so that was like an interesting thing. And one of those people that reached out to us, which was like a dream for us, was this the Toronto Reference Library. So it took about a year and a half to kind of figure out how this is gonna be. They'd never done an installation like this before. So this is the entrance to the installation. Um, and so what Space for Grief is, it's, it's an immersive public art installation that is intended to inspire and provoke social conversations around the expression of grief. It's a gathering space uh, where individuals can come to it together and share in, in community around grief and loss. So this is kind of the, the beginning. If you were there, uh, some of you were, had checked it out, so it's, so it might be familiar. Uh, our mission in this process of designing this was an, an ongoing is recognizing one's grief and expressing it, helping others show up for others and inspiring policy change as Zan referenced before. So just to give you a little context so people could walk through it, 
This was inspired by nature, by the forest. We used co like combinations of build form architecture and organic plant matter to create that surreal environment and use lighting and, and like real dirt. <laughs> Um, and benches provided space for people to read some of the prompts and have reflection and just have their own time. Uh, we had about 200 people come out for our opening reception, at, um, which was amazing. And we had uh, Chief Stacey Laforme, he saged the space and spoke. Uh, and, and it was just, you know, we sold out. Uh, we had people standing off to the side. It was, it was quite impactful. And, uh, And then the last part of our um, installation was people could write messages and, and leave them and other people could read those messages. Um, and we got about, uh, we got a lot of messages uh, that Zan will speak to. Um, so that was the, uh, the process. And these are just some of the messages that people had left, just to give you an idea. Okay. And then I'm, now I'm gonna pass it back to Zan for closing. So the messages were part of the a participatory component, and they were inspired by an initiative called the Temple at a festival called Burning Man, where we experienced, it, it was a very interesting thing to see people coming and sharing stories about their grief, about the causes of their grief, messages left, left unsaid to people who had passed on or transitioned, as well as messages to their past selves. We left it pretty open, and we were kind of blown away by the types of messages that people left and how vulnerable people were. And the fact that at a public installation, not one person over the course of the week attempted to deface or draw any squiggly lines, nothing. It was a brilliant experience. And at the end, we burned the messages and people came out for that. But we realized how powerful, powerful it is for people to be able to see messages from people they might not otherwise hang out with or talk to across generations and age ranges. And the amount of time that people of all, like su such a wide age range of people came and spent ages in, in, in fact, one group stayed for a few hours, and it was very special to witness. And we composed a soundtrack for this as well that was inspired like a little bit by what grief might feel like and exploring various emotions. And it's intended to act as a soundtrack to your memories. It, we had, might have a couple of minutes left, and I'd invite everyone to just take a second to just close your eyes, take a deep breath, reflect on what you've been feeling today, this week, this year, and think about what makes you feel your strongest feelings. Think about how you show up for yourself on a day-to-day. -day. Think about how you show up for others. And take a few minutes to just go through your thoughts while this soundscape hopefully plays in the background. Thank you so much for your time and attention and I'll leave you to the meditation. Thank you.
thank you so much. And just a final words before we close. Um, what happened with space? A lot of, we were surprised by the number of people who came, the amount of engagement. We were able to get national media coverage. Um, Spacing Magazine wrote us up, and we got featured in Place by Place Making Canada, Jane's Walk, um, multiple covers of the CBC. But our favorite part is what's coming next. And starting November 3rd, we, oh, this also happened in the middle, um, but after November 3rd, we will be at the Evergreen Brickworks for two weeks, opening up the Good Morning Festival and Day of the Dead. And it's a chance for us to take the vision from the first one and try to go bigger with our visual fidelity, with our activities, soundscape, and what we might be able to do. So we really hope that some folks can come and join us. Let us know, and we'll, we'd love to see you. And biggest thank you to Peter Jones and to Suzanne Stein from OCAD, who have helped us out so much over the course of this project and been just inspirational to us through and through. And perfect segue to Peter, who is going to come up and really talk about systems. <laughs> Thanks.